Jana um, for tonight's class. Thanks, Mary. So I'm Jana Fishback. I'm the Executive Director with Sustainable Wenatchee. If you're not familiar with us, we're a local nonprofit, about three years old, working to promote a culture of environmental stewardship and social sustainability in the Valley. Um, and you can learn more at sustainablewenatchee.org if you're interested. And Joan, our presenter tonight is our long, longest standing board member. She's been with us since about the beginning. We're very, very grateful to have her. She's absolutely an expert in this topic tonight. She's a, a climate reality leader, has been specially trained, and she is a um, professor at the Wenatchee Valley College in geography and sustainability. And so I would like to welcome Joan. Thank you, Jana, and thank you, Mary. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Uh, I'm really excited to see you here tonight and uh, get this chance to talk uh, with you. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen because I do have a presentation. Uh, let me make sure that I share the computer sound. And so right now you should be able to see uh, where it says prognosis planet Earth. Thumbs up, Jana? Yes, good. So I decided to, to call it this uh, prognosis planet Earth because it's 2020, right? And so health, public health, this virus, it's really front of mind. And so uh, understanding the health of the planet, I thought was uh, a good way to title this, as well as the fact that 2020 is also the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day in 1970. And so that's the other claim to fame for this year in my book. Uh, 1970, the first Earth Day was when 20 million Americans, which was about 10% of the US population at that time, rallied against the way we were treating the environment. There was industrial pollution that was alighting rivers on fire there were oil spills that were blackening beaches. And so 1970 actually marked this turning point. We had enough of a political consensus, if you can believe that, um, that we created the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. They passed the Clean Air Act. Uh, and then soon after the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. So, you know, it's been 50 years uh, since 1970. So I think it's time for us to sort of take a check right now as to how we feel about how we've done over this past 50 years in terms of the health of our planet. So I'm gonna ask Jana to um, put up the poll and I'm hoping it will show while we have this. Yes, good. So if you wouldn't mind just telling us here by marking what you think the prognosis for planet Earth is. You've got your choices there. And then once everybody's had a chance to do that, we will share the results with you. We're doing good. We've got 85% who have voted. There may be some people who have moved away from their screen. Yay. Okay, Jana, I think maybe we'll... We Go ahead could, and end it. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should end it. And uh, I hope everybody can see the results here. Uh, it looks like the majority of people said the prognosis for planet Earth is fair. Unfortunately, poor came in second. Uh, and uh, thankfully, not too many people with terminal and nobody said it was excellent. Well, that's not surprising. Uh, and I don't think those, uh, those results are very surprising. But I'm hoping that with what we talk about tonight, that maybe we can, um, you know, be a little bit more hopeful and also, well, we'll see. Hopefully by the end, you will feel a bit more hopeful or maybe you won't, but we'll, we'll check in again. Okay, so um, I'm going to show the next slide here. 
This is one of my favorite uh, Time Magazine covers, and it did come out this year, One Last Chance. It shows the urgency of how we felt um, coming up for this 50th anniversary of Earth Day, the defining year for the planet. And artist Jill Pelto, what she did was she took the climate data trend lines starting in 1880, uh, which was the beginning of the instrumental record where we could start measuring these uh, things. And so the blue there is the rise in sea level over time. Uh, so the left would be 1880 and then the, the right hand side there is 2020. We've got ice loss uh, over land. We've got renewable energy consumption in the green there. So trending upwards, that's a good sign. We have the global average temperature, which is in the yellow, and then it tracks pretty well with the um, carbon dioxide emissions, which is what the gray there is. And if you look in the upper right hand corner there, you see kind of the drop off. That was the expected drop of about 7% due to the pandemic and what uh, that will mean in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. Right now, the latest is that we're actually more like 8.8% drop, um, but, you know, this is probably very temporary, even so. So here's a preview of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, we are obviously going to focus on what is the state of the planet with a, a special focus on climate. I'm going to talk about some species extinctions as well as uh, vital ecosystems. I'm going to point out three in particular. I'm going to give you a little of the very basic science of climate change and its impacts in north central Washington, but I also want to talk about climate justice. I want to also look at who is most vulnerable to harm. We'll talk about what can be done and then we'll sort of turn it around and give you a chance to talk a little bit about maybe what you might want to do. And I don't mean you actually have to talk about it, but you'll get a chance to maybe think about that and discuss it in some uh, breakout rooms too. And uh, the byline is also kind of what kind of ancestor do you want to be for those people who are celebrating Earth Day in 2070, uh, the 100th anniversary of Earth Day. So that's the plan. Okay, now I did mention or Jana mentioned that I'm a geographer. As a geographer, a central focus for our study is human land interactions, okay? how humans and the environment relate to each other. And if we're talking about how humans relate to the land, it's very important that we acknowledge that we are living on the land of the Squosa, I'm not very good at pronouncing that, Livia, you could help, uh, tribal lands and waters. And what's, what I think is really important also to recognize in that is that, uh, you know, these people, that the Xhosa people had a very deep connection to the land. And as native people, as indigenous people, the perspective is that they are part of nature, not apart from nature. So nature isn't just there for their use, right? And in fact, yesterday when uh, I was able to be on a webinar with some uh, elders, native elders from the Okanagan, uh, one of them said, we are the land and the land is us. And I think that's the kind of mindset that we need to try to move towards if we are going to be able to have a more sustainable future. And so keep that in mind as we're going through this, because I think we're really fortunate to live in these beautiful, this beautiful area that was stewarded so well for so long by the native people. And, and I think I just have great respect for the way they uh, look at the land and uh, nature itself. So um, if we are talking about a uh, connection to the natural world, this was one of the first times that it became more obvious for a lot of Americans. This is the iconic blue marble, the photograph that was taken by Apollo 17 astronauts in 1972. And it was a time of realization that we really only have one home. Earth is our home and we all share it, right? We share the same oceans and the sh same atmospheres. We're all connected. And so I wanted to start off today, just a reminder about that. 
And then as a geographer also, what I love about this particular NASA image is the orientation, right? So you might recognize the African continent there with Madagascar and the Saudi Arabian uh, Peninsula, um, but it looks upside down, right? <laughs> For what we're familiar with. But of course they were taking this photograph from outer space and, and there is no up or down. And so it's just historical convention that puts the north at the top of the map for us. Okay, there's our home. And here's a, a quick overview of how the greenhouse effect works with the solar radiation coming in, the light, light waves, and then re-radiating, uh, being absorbed in the land and the water, some of it moving out through the atmosphere but also quite a bit of it being trapped because of the greenhouse gases that create the atmosphere, right? So it's really important that we have a greenhouse effect. We don't wanna be one of those ice planets uh, far away from the sun. We wanna have a living planet, but the problem is that as that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are increasing, we're trapping more of that heat, leading to the warming. And that warming then is uh, in this graph, what it's showing you is over time, we know that planet Earth has gone through warming and cooling periods. Those are the natural cycles. But, and here you'll see 800,000 years uh, previous to today. Uh, that, you know, they have some data about carbon dioxide levels from that long ago. Uh, scientists have collected ice core samples in Antarctica, looked at dissolved carbon dioxide levels. So we can see that for most of that 800,000 years, right, we stayed below 300 parts per million molecules of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, per million other molecules. But in the 1950s, okay, which many people recognize as kind of the start of the Anthropocene, the era where human impact uh, was really starting to show on the environment and in the, in the climate, we moved beyond that level of 300 parts per million. And in fact, today we're closer to 411 parts per million. And this is problematic. 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide is considered a safe level, but uh, you know, once we get past that, which we have, uh, we're, we're getting into dangerous territory. And so what happens is that we have warmer and warmer years, 19 of the 20 hottest years. And then within the last five years, we've got the hottest of any on record. And 2020, according to Carbon Brief, is on track to be the warmest year, if not the second warmest year on record. So we'll just have to wait for the evidence to confirm that. Okay, now I'm hoping I can move forward. Uh-oh, doesn't wanna let me move forward. So I will go to next slide. Now we're gonna take a trip back to middle school science here with the hydrological cycle. I hope everybody remembers it well. Uh, we never lose water in that cycle, right? It just changes form from evaporation to precipitation, water returning to the sea. And the reason I bring this up is because global warming has a huge impact on the water cycle. And we see that when we look at, uh, when we look at, what that extra heat is doing, what that warming is doing to the water cycle, right? It's evaporating more water from the oceans and that's leading to larger rain events and floods. So we can see that happening in some places. At the same time, that extra heat is evaporating more moisture from the land, leading to drought and drier conditions. So you can have both of these going on uh, and that's because of what's happening with the water cycle. For us living here in our region, this means melting glaciers, right? Lower snowpack, that's our water reservoir. That's so important. And um, most models project that we'll get more rainfall in winter, spring and fall with short-term heavy rainfall events becoming more frequent, but drier, hotter summers. 
This will affect the availability of water for fish, farming and households, increasing flood and fire hazards with economic impacts for agriculture, recreation, tourism and other sectors. Are there any questions in the chat? I just thought I should. Okay, good. So now you see it, now you don't. Um, not a good scenario. As we know here on the West Coast, one of our biggest impacts in terms of climate change is fires, wildfires in particular. And so you can see in this graph, the tracking of these large fires, temperature, uh, over the years and how there is a relationship between the hotter temperatures and um, the, the fires. Sorry, those, those little animations love to repeat themselves. So mega fires, right? Larger, faster, more intense wildfires. And when you have those fires, they can actually cause global warming as well because they are releasing more of that stored carbon into the atmosphere. So that's also problematic. I like the graph on the left. It shows the acres burned uh, with 2020. California obviously had a terrible year, um, but we have had bad years as well. And 2020 is kind of the second worst. And the, you know, the evidence is that this will continue to happen. Uh, let's see, what else did I want to say about that? Megafires not only burn more acres, but have a large impact on the environment and people, increasing risks to residents and emergency services. Our warmer, drier summers create spark-ready terrain and tinder dry forest fuels building up over time. And then if we add in the fact that people are encroaching into the wildland areas, then we have those very ripe conditions for megafires. Okay, another uh, result of global warming and of our Anthropocene era is this sixth mass extinction. In contrast to the past mass extinctions, today's species losses are driven by a mix of direct exploitation like overfishing or chemical pollution, and then indirect harm through destruction of habitats and climate change. So here you see a couple of the species that um, you know, we have, we are losing or we have lost with the sixth mass extinction. And there's a lot of them in every sort of level of, of um, species, 500 species of land animals. So I wanna turn now to looking at the health of Earth's vital ecosystems. And I'm gonna focus in particular on the oceans, the forests with deforestation and wetlands. So if we start with the oceans, it's particularly troubling what's happening there. About 30% of carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed into the ocean. So they play this vital role to capture those carbon dioxide emissions as well. But by doing that, um, because there is so much carbon to be absorbed, it's making the oceans more acidic. And that is harmful to uh, the, the wildlife there. It's harmful to shellfish in particular, and it's decimated certain industries like the oyster industry here in Washington state, uh, bleaching coral reefs because the ocean is becoming more acidic. And of course, those coral reefs are the basis of the marine food chain. So we have all sorts of problems in terms of both the ocean acidification and the warming. Uh, then, as you can see in the photograph here, there's the pollution, right? And particularly plastic pollution. Eight million metric tons of plastic enters the ocean each year. Since 1970, the global production of plastics, and remember plastics are derived from fossil fuels, uh, has increased more than tenfold to nearly half a billion metric tons per year. In just the last 13 years, we've doubled the total quantity of plastic ever made. And my concern is that as the fossil fuel industries are um, having, you know, there's less demand for some of those products, less demand for oil, for example, if we are making some of these changes, that they're going to try and increase the production of plastic even more because it's another way to use that oil. 
Um, so we do need to keep an eye on this as well. Uh, okay, the Amazon rainforest, deforestation, right? The Amazon rainforest contains 10% of all the biomass in, uh, on the earth. It means that when deforestation takes place, the vast amounts of carbon that the forest stores are released into the atmosphere. Now we know that almost one fifth of the Amazon, Amazonian forests were lost over the past half century. And half of the world's tropical forests have been lost globally. So the forests in Indonesia, the forests in Central Africa and places like that. This is definitely problematic because forests have such an important role in absorbing and sequestering that carbon. Another vital ecosystem that is really important to uh, store or sequester carbon is wetlands. And we used to think of wetlands as wastelands, but they play a really important role in uh, the Earth's systems. They actually make up about 6% of the Earth's surface and they store 35% of the world's carbon and they can reduce coastal storm damage. They're also home for about one third of all threatened and endangered species. Unfortunately, we are losing wetlands. We're losing wetlands to drought, to pollution, and then to just outright destruction to make way for industry and urbanization. So, you know, problems in some of these vital ecosystems. I would have to say that, you know, this is, I hope uh, probably most people agree, this is not really the legacy that we want. While the past five decades have revealed some significant triumphs of environmental protection, we've also had notable failures, uh, which have led to the continuing deterioration of Earth's natural systems. The accumulation of these wastes on land, in water, and in the sky is the most visible manifestation of the human impact on planet Earth. So leave you with that photograph for a while. I don't really want to look at it too much longer. Uh, there's growing scientific evidence that demonstrates planetary scale human disruption of the Earth's systems. As humanity has been focused on a business as usual world, Things are anything but usual for planet Earth. So what can we do, right? We've had this little synopsis of where we are, but almost more importantly is what will we do? Uh, because we have known for a while <laughs> about the problems. We've known for a while some of the solutions. We haven't always had the will to put them into practice. So these are the questions we need to keep in mind as we go forward. Certainly, science and technology offers some solutions, right? We, um, we, can have a, we, can, we can drive electric vehicles, Link Transit has their electric buses. We have charging stations around the place, thanks to plug-in North Central Washington and people like Randy Brooks who are on this call. Uh, so plugging into renewable energy, if you have an electric car, we're really lucky to live here because uh, you know we are plugging into renewable power. If you have an electric car and you're still plugging into coal powered electricity, it doesn't make as much sense, right? But so that's a great solution. Uh, we can, you know, we can put wind power over the sea where there's reliable, this wind that will help with the, the renewable energy. We also need to build out our distribution systems, our transmission, our networks. If we had wind, more wind machines in Tornado Alley, uh, if we put more solar panels in the Southwest US, if we had better distribution systems, we could really locate those in key regions and then be able to have this renewable power, renewable clean energy that we could use in all different places within the US. And I have to put um, the cover of Drawdown there if we're talking about science and, and technology and innovations. Drawdown is such a wonderful book. I use it as a textbook in my sustainability course. 
uh, it's a hundred solutions for drawing down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And these solutions are, some of them are technological, but others are things like um, educating girls. And we have uh, better refrigerant management and reducing food waste. So things that we really can do that we already have the technology for, um, and even things about regenerative agriculture, promoting biological conservation. We have to find better ways to manage our forests and our ag lands, habitat protection through economic incentives that support sustainable development. I haven't spent a lot of time talking about the economics of all of this, um, but you know, if we don't address these issues now, we will be in much worse economic problems later. A lot of people who uh, resist um, implementing some of these solutions, a lot of times it's, it's an economic argument. But I think what's not recognized is that we're already, uh, you know, in our economics, we're not paying the true cost for a lot of our materials and a lot of our, obviously our fossil fuel energy sector but uh, we really do need to recognize that we're already feeling the economic impact when we have all these natural disasters and we're trying to help people rebuild and get back on their feet. We're just not figuring that in the right column of our accounting, uh, but very important as well. Now, for those of us living in North Central Washington, we're in an agricultural region, I really, think it's important to recognize soil as a solution. And I really enjoyed the recent release of the Kiss the Ground film that Waste Loop up in uh, Leavenworth did a preview for. So I've taken a little clip from it and I hope you'll be able to hear it on your screen. But I think it's a great little four minute clip that sort of brings all this together, but also gives us some hope in terms of soil as a solution. Do you feel hopeless about climate change and the damage we are doing to our planet? I did. But then I was shown a new way to look at the problem, which made the solution so obvious and so within reach. A solution that's right under our feet. I've been sharing this story with everyone I know, and now I want to share it with you. Climate change is all about too much carbon in our atmosphere, right? But carbon's not our enemy. It's the building block of life. Everything alive is made of it. It's us. The problem and the solution are simply a matter of balance. To see this balance, let's step back and look at the five pools of where carbon is stored on planet Earth. Atmosphere, biosphere, oceans, soil, and fossil. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants appeared on land, Carbon began to cycle in an amazing... Uh-oh, sorry. Oh. Do you feel hopeless oh, about really climate... Forward, sorry about that. Starting about 500 million years ago, when plants appeared on land, carbon began to cycle in an amazing balance between these pools. A balance that allowed for life as we know it to evolve. Then one life form, us, figured out how to extract carbon from the fossil pool, which is pretty much a permanent timeout zone for carbon. Then we burned it for energy, putting it into play, disrupting that balance. Human beings have done several other things to throw this natural carbon balance out of whack. The way we manage land and do agriculture is moving even more carbon from the soil and biosphere into the atmosphere. Specifically, we've moved 534 gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is heating up the planet and destabilizing our climate. The big question is, where do we put this excess carbon? Well, remember when I said that the solution is right under our feet? It literally is. It's the soil. It turns out we already have a technology that removes carbon from the atmosphere. And it's got 500 million years of research and development behind it. 
plants with sunlight and water perform photosynthesis. They pull in carbon from the air and turn it into carbohydrates, sugars. Then they pump some of those sugars down through their roots to feed microorganisms who use that carbon to build soil. Voila, carbon move. Plants pump it in and soil stores it. Nature's living technology is amazing. What if we worked with this regenerative technology instead of destroying it? How could we do that? By giving a little carbon back. Scientists have recently discovered that applying a thin layer of compost sets up an ongoing positive feedback loop that brings more and more carbon into the soil each year. In concert with other regenerative practices like not tilling the soil, planting trees, cover crops, and planned grazing, we can build and retain gigatons of soil carbon. This is carbon farming. This is regenerative agriculture. And there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Check this out. Unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the ground is good for us. It makes healthy soil, which is nutrient rich, full of life, and holds way more water. This means more nutritious food and crops that are more resilient in the face of drought. That's good news for farmers, families, and everyone that eats. Remember this, the way we grow our food, fiber, and fuel either puts carbon up into the atmosphere or it pulls it down into the ground. The regeneration of soil is the task of our generation. Our health, the health of our soils, and the health of our planet are one and the same. hope you enjoyed that as much as, as I like that little clip. I think it really pulls all of this together and uh, reminds us about uh, our, how our own health is connected to the health of the planet as well. So who would have thought that a solution is actually under our feet? Uh, well, I know that Betsy, uh, who's on the call, would, would know that um, as someone who is involved in a lot of landscaping and composting and also indigenous people who've been trying to tell us indigenous leaders for many years that, oh dear, it's starting again, that trying to teach us that this is really important, that we need to connect back with the land that we stand on. So uh, I really like this quote from um, Bear, the location and nature of climate change's worst effects on human society are geographically delineated by persistent legacies of racism, slavery, removal, and colonialism. This is where we start talking about the importance of turning to indigenous people as leaders who are so connected to the land and understand it so well, these systems, that we start to need to start listening to those voices. Uh, and certainly they are people who are often the most impacted by our historical legacies of pollution and uh, colonialism. So, uh, in fact, many solutions now are being informed by uh, the, they're drawing on local and indigenous knowledge, inspired by people like Winona Laduk, uh, an Ojibwe person and the Ponca Nation's Casey Camp to develop regionally adapted approaches that respect traditional relationships with the land. The photograph up in the left is Nemonte Nemquino, and she is an indigenous leader from the Ecuadorian Amazon who led grassroots action to protect 500,000 acres of rainforest from oil extraction. She was given the Goldman environmental prize yesterday for that effort. So in my opinion, um, there is hope. We mentioned earlier uh, the Chelan County Climate Resilience Plan before we started the presentation, someone asked about that. I did just wanna remind everybody else and people who maybe uh, came on a little bit more recently 
that Chelan County has been working on drafting a strategy to help us be more climate resilient here in terms of our water supply, in terms of adaptations and mitigations for managing forest and wildfire danger. Uh, and so tomorrow and Thursday, there are two meetings in the morning that you can attend and, and learn more about this, this draft plan and give input on it. If you are interested in that, there is a link on Sustainable Wenatchee website under the events tab, and then you can register for that meeting. So also globally, uh, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think this is really important because there's been an increased focus. These are United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They were put into place after the Millennial Development Goals, which ended in the year 2000. So these are goals for the year 2030. And uh, most countries who are part of the United Nations are trying to work towards these goals. And there are very specific indicators that they are tasked with trying to meet. So it is measurable. And if you go onto the website, you can learn more about these goals. What I really like about them is that they include um, environmental protection as well as sustainable development and social justice. So they recognize that poverty, inequality, and injustice can be drivers of environmental degradation and that the human impacts of this degradation fall disproportionately on the poorest citizens of the world. So if we want to right this injustice, we need system level change, right? But institutions don't change without pressure from the ground up. So people themselves need to put pressure on those institutions to change. And that's where I find a lot of hope in our youth leaders, right? Whether they're leaders in the Sunrise Movement or whether they're some of my heroes pictured here, Greta um, Thunberg and Malala, who, you know, tell it like it is. Uh, because they are the ones who will be impacted the most and they are taking on these leadership roles. So I really find hope in, in the youth and my students and the activism that uh, this next generation is doing. At the same time, I don't want my generation to shirk our responsibility and burden them to clean up our mess. So I'm always asking myself and asking, asking you here, what kind of planet do we want to leave to them? So uh, my colleague and dear friend who I think is still on the Zoom tonight, put together uh, a volume called Dear America, which is available in uh, the bookstore in Leavenworth. And it is uh, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. And in it is uh, an essay by one of my favorite writers, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who talks about what kind of ancestor do you want to be on choosing to belong to a place. So I really like her words here that I have added to the screen. You know, native people have a different term for public lands. They call them home, our sustainer, our library, our pharmacy, our sacred places. Land is not capital to which we have property rights. Rather, it is the place for which we have a moral responsibility in reciprocity for its gift of life, the source of our most profound sense of belonging. And for me, this last one really speaks to me uh, in this time of uh, you know, divisiveness in our country. In a time of great polarity and division, the common ground we crave is in fact beneath our feet. It harkens back to the Kiss the Soil video there. The very land on which we stand is our foundation and can be a source of shared identity and common cause. So I really like that one. 
I highly recommend trying to pick up one of these volumes if you haven't yet. There's really great essays there and you can read more about Robin Wall Kimmerer's piece. Uh, she also wrote Braiding Sweetgrass, which is another great book. So let's reflect a little bit more about how each of us can use our skills or talents to take appropriate action and become better 100th day Earth, hundredth Earth Day ancestors, right? When we're looking, when people are looking back on what we did now, um, there's a sense of urgency. There's a sense of urgency from those youth leaders, from Malala, from Greta. There's a sense of urgency from the scientists who are telling us, you know, 13 more years, you got, we've got to do something. Um, and, and so we really can't wait anymore. It is time for action. We've done the research. We know the solutions. We need to now have the will to put some of these into action. So uh, I, I think that all of us on this call have talents or skills that we could put towards this. We might be artists or songwriters. We might be builders or designers, farmers, healers, teachers, cooks, gardeners, whoever we are, we have something that we can bring to the table here. We have something that we can contribute. There's something that we can add to this movement. What, the question is, what will we do? And how do we choose to belong to this place? So what we'd like to do now, if everybody's willing, is to move to um, the next segment of this presentation, which is the breakout sessions. But maybe before I do that, I should check to make sure that there aren't any, uh, any questions. I'll go to stop share. Everybody's so quiet. Any questions?